Hello, and welcome to our next lesson in the series of lessons on plants, what they look like, and how they work. The topic of today's lesson is looking at transpiration in plants. Have you ever thought about why does this happen when you put a plant in a plastic bag or a glass bottle? Well, today we're going to find out. Now we're going to look at the concept map of the topics that we will be covering in this lesson and the next lesson. We are looking at plants. In the last lesson, we looked at the structure of leaves, stems, and roots. What we are doing this time is we are looking at their function. What do they actually do? And most of it is to do with water. We're going to start off with leaves, which we studied in the last lesson. And leaves use water for photosynthesis, and they lose water. And those two topics are what we're going to be looking at in this lesson. Other parts of the plant and what they do with water will be the topic of the next lesson. To be able to understand this section, you need to know certain concepts from the previous lesson. For example, you need to know what all the different parts of the plant look like and what types of tissues are found in them. You also need to know two very important concepts that you should have done earlier in the year, which is diffusion, which is how substances move from a high concentration to a low concentration, and the other one is osmosis, which is how water moves through membranes. To make sure you understand this, I'm briefly going to revise those two concepts. First one is diffusion. You should have done this in natural science earlier on in high school, and that is how molecules move from a high concentration to a low concentration. If we look at this example, if a drop of syrup is placed into a beaker of water, Within a short space of time, those little syrup molecules would have spread throughout the entire beaker. And that is called diffusion. Diffusion can also occur through membranes as long as the molecules, for example, oxygen, can move freely through the membrane. If we look at this diagram here, is the experiment in the beginning with a high concentration of particles, say oxygen, outside the cell and nothing inside the cell. So we end up with a big concentration difference. A high concentration and a low concentration. What the particles then do is they move through the membrane from the high concentration to the low concentration. After time has passed, diffusion will stop because we have inside and outside the cell exactly the same concentration. The next one, which you should have done earlier on when you did the cell, is a process called osmosis. And osmosis is a type of diffusion, except it involves only water molecules and how they move through a semi-permeable membrane. Let's have a look at the example. Here we have, on this side, in this little square, lots of water molecules. In a square the same size 
On the other side of the membrane, we have fewer molecules. So this is a high concentration. This is a low concentration. And as you can see, the water molecules are moving through the little gaps in the membrane from a high concentration to a low concentration. But you might ask, what about the little red particles? Why don't they move from a high concentration to a low concentration? Let's see why. If you look at the size, and those represent, for example, sugar molecules, they cannot fit through the spaces in the membrane. So large molecules can't fit through the membrane, but smaller molecules can, and that's why we call it a semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. In this lesson, we are going to look at transpiration, which is how water is lost from the leaves of a plant. Where do the leaves get the water from? So this is transpiration, water being given off. Where does the water come from? It's got to come from the water in the soil, moving all the way into the roots, up the stem, and then into the leaves. And that's what we're going to be starting to look at today. To understand this, you need to remember what a leaf looks like. So we're going to do a bit of a re revision on how or what the inside of a leaf looks like. So to start off, on the upper and lower surfaces, we have an epidermis with a waxy cuticle. In the center of the leaf, we have our mesophyll, some of which are long and closely packed, some of which are smaller and rounded, the spongy mesophyll, and the palisade mesophyll. Then, in between these cells, we have got substances being provided through the vein, namely water, and substances, namely carbon dioxide, moving in through the stomata. So, we're just getting started, but I think maybe you should take a breath and we can have a bit of a break before we really get into the depth of the material. Welcome back. Now we're going to start looking at the detail of leaves and what leaves do with water and why. We need to revise the structure of a leaf and how leaves use water. So we're going to have a look at this picture, simple diagram of a section through a leaf, and have a look at how water moves. Water comes out of the xylem, which is there. It moves into all the cells, and it also moves into the spaces. The cells use the water for photosynthesis, but some of the water that goes into the spaces actually moves right out through the leaf, and that is what we call transpiration. This is another picture showing palisade mesophyll, spongy mesophyll, and the parts which are involved in transpiration, namely stomata, with the guard cells, and another one we haven't talked about, and that is the fact that on the outside of the leaf, 
there is something called a waxy cuticle and water cannot easily move through the waxy cuticle unless it's very, very thin. We're going to have a look at some experiments. You might have done some of these experiments at school. So we're going to look at two experiments. First one is put a plant inside a glass bottle. What do you notice on the inside of the glass bottle? Water droplets. Even if you don't have any equipment at your school, a simple plastic bag around a leaf on a bush left in the sun will show you that transpiration does occur. You will see some type of liquid collecting on the inside of the plastic bag or of the glass bottle. You might also have done a more precise experiment at school in which you prove that that liquid being given off from a leaf is actually water and that is using a blue colored chemical which is infused in a paper and that is blue if it's dry but if there's even water vapor in the atmosphere it turns pink it won't change color if it's any other liquid so if we look at this picture here that's cobalt chloride paper which is the blue paper on the underside and top side of a leaf and it has turned pink showing that water has been given off from the leaf. Now, why do plants undergo transpiration? Because surely they need water. They do. But to survive, they need food. And to photosynthesize, they are going to need carbon dioxide. So, if we look at a leaf, carbon dioxide has to go into the leaf. Let's see if we can get this to work. Yes. Carbon dioxide has to go into the leaf through the stoma, but it can only do so when it's open. And when it's open, water comes out of the leaf. So, a plant has to try and balance its need for food and its need to keep water. So many plants have specialized ways to try and reduce how much water they lose through transpiration. What we're going to look at now is the different ways that plants can try and lessen transpiration. In several ways. They can retain water vapor, they can prevent water loss, they can have as few stomata as possible and have stomata mainly on the lower leaf surface. And we're going to have a look at an example of each one of these. First one is retaining water vapor. And the way plants can do this is have hairs, have sunken stomata, or simply the leaves roll up. Let's have a look at each example. Here we have hairy leaves. And you can see quite clearly, this is taken under magnified. You can see all the hairs, and this picture is taken under normal circumstances. That's not even magnified. Next way that they can try and retain water vapor is to have their stomata sunken. So if we look at this, this is a stoma at the bottom there, but it's inside a hole. And this is called a sunken stomata and water vapor gets trapped inside this little hole which helps lessen water loss. Third example is leaves that roll themselves up. Again, 
to try and keep the water vapor inside them. And if we have a look at this picture, this is a plant which has got several of these methods, namely the hairs, the sunken stomata, and the fact that it is rolled up. This plant would survive in a dry environment because it's not going to lose too much water. The next way that plants can try and lessen transpiration is by having a thick cuticle. And if we have a look at this example, picture taken under a microscope, that pink part, that is the cuticle, which is pretty thick. So it's a bit like a plastic bag around the leaf. It doesn't lose water very easily. Then this other picture is a more detailed, um, a more magnified diagram. And this has got a very thick cuticle. You can see it. And you can also see the stomata are sunken. So this has got two methods, sunken stomata and an extra thick cuticle. And you can see quite clearly how when water vapor moves out, it's going to collect here. It's not going to move away from the plant very, very quickly. Then, the next aspect is have as few stomata as possible. And most plants have this by having very, very small leaves. And you can see in this diagram, the leaves have got a smaller surface area so that there is less stomata so that they lose less water. And then the last one is that most plants have stomata on the lower surface of a leaf only. Some of them have stomata mainly on the lower surface of the leaf. So, how far we are, we're looking at leaves and we're looking at how they lose water in transpiration. Now, you might have done some experiments in class on how fast transpiration occurs. What, what we're going to look at now is a piece of apparatus called a potometer, which is used to measure exactly how much water a plant loses in a specific space of time. And it is quite important that you understand how this piece of apparatus actually measures transpiration. Okay, if we look at this, this is the piece of apparatus called a potometer. It consists of a leafy twig, that's a stopper there. And this is water. The entire potometer, everything here in blue, is water. As the plant loses water through transpiration, it's going to be sucking water up from the potometer. To be able to work out how fast it's, move, it's sucking the water up, you introduce an air bubble into the capillary tube. Now, as the plant sucks water up, this capillary tube, the bubble in the capillary tube, is going to be moving closer to the plant. And the faster it moves, the faster transpiration is occurring. So if there's lots of water being given off, from all of the leaves, this bubble is going to be moving very, very quickly. And that is how scientists can work out, well, how fast is transpiration occurring? And in our next section, oops, sorry. Okay, we are going to be looking at leaves and how Leaves lose water in transpiration, but more importantly, what makes them lose a lot of water quickly? How can they save water?
welcome back to our lesson on life sciences, where we are looking at how leaves lose water in the process of transpiration. We've already looked at how the water moves out of the leaf, and we are now going to be looking at, well, what makes plants lose water quickly? In other words, factors affecting transpiration. And there are certain environmental factors which will make plants lose water more quickly or more slowly, and we're going to be having a look at each of those. The four we're going to be looking at are temperature. If it's hotter, do plants lose, lose water more quickly? Light intensity. If it's brighter, do plants lose water more quickly? If it's windy, do they lose more water more quickly? Or if it's humid, if there's moisture in the air, will they lose water more quickly or more slowly? So we're going to have a look at each one of these to see how does this work. Okay, and we're starting off with temperature. Now, as we know, when things get hot, molecules start moving very, very quickly. So transpiration would occur more quickly. So because it's hot, the rate of evaporation is faster. The molecules move faster. They move out of the stomata faster. Another point is that the water holding capacity of warm air is greater than that of cold air, so more water can evaporate into the air. Now, if we use a potometer and actually measure how much water is lost at different temperatures and we plot it on a graph, we end up with something like this. And this is what we're going to have a look at now. Why does this graph look like it does? So, first of all, as the temperature increases, the rate of transpiration increases, and that's here. Okay, there's your temperature getting greater, and what's happening to your rate of transpiration? It is increasing. Oops. But, after a while, that increase stops. Why? And the reason for that is, as it gets very hot and the plant loses too much water, the stomata start closing. So even if the air is hot, because the stomata are closed, more transpiration can't occur. So your transpiration rate then stabilizes or remains more or less constant. Next factor we're looking at is light intensity. In other words, how bright the light is. Will more transpiration occur at midday than just at 7 o'clock in the morning when the light is actually not bright? Well, let's have a look at what the scientists have found out by doing experiments using a potometer and a plant placed at different light intensities. So what we have here is... As your light intensity increases, in other words, as the light gets brighter, again, increase of transpiration occurs drastically. Oh dear, but then look what happens here. It evens out. Okay, so at first, the rate of transpiration increases, and the reason is the stomata are opening wider. But... As we get to this section here, these poor stomata are as wide as they can get. They can't open any wider, so the stomata can't open any wider, and therefore the same amount of water moves out all the time, so the transpiration level remains constant.
next one we're having a look at is humidity. If there's moisture in the atmosphere, how is that going to affect transpiration? Will it have any effect? Looking at the results of experiments using potometers and putting them under the same plant, being put under different conditions of humidity, scientists end up with a graph that looks like this. And boy, is it very different to the other graphs we have seen. But why? Let's analyze the graph. Okay, so at the beginning, which is here, okay, that's when the air is very dry. So water vapor diffuses rapidly out. Okay, in other words, this is high transpiration here. And low humidity. So transpiration occurs very quickly. Does it keep like that? No, something different happens. Because after that little bit, transpiration drops. Why would it drop? Okay, because here the humidity is high. And because there's so much air or so much water in the air outside, air is more humid. Okay, so transpiration decreases. And would it ever stop? It can stop if the concentration in the, of water in the atmosphere is as high as the concentration of water inside the leaf. And that would be very, very rarely because the air inside the leaf is saturated with water. So it generally just slows down, but it doesn't completely stop. So it stops almost completely. Why? Okay, and this diagram illustrates why and how this occurs. This is a section at the top of a leaf. Okay, let's get pen here. Oh, come on. Okay, so that's your epidermis. Here's your epidermis. There's your stoma. And here's the palisade mesophyll, and here is an air space, and the little yellow things are the water molecules. If it's very humid, this is the air outside, and if we have a look, there's a fairly high concentration of water molecules in the air. There's also a fairly high concentration of water molecules inside the leaf. And if the concentration is the same, is there going to be diffusion? No, diffusion will stop. But as I said, generally, there's a little bit of a higher concentration here inside the leaf. So a few of those molecules will actually move out, but not many of them. Now, an important term coming across here is something called a concentration gradient. And that is the difference between the concentration of water here in the air and the concentration of water here inside the leaf. And if the, there is no con concentration gradient because the concentration is the same, there isn't going to be any diffusion of water vapor out of the leaf. If there's no water outside the leaf, there's going to be a high concentration gradient so transpiration would occur much, much faster. Next one we're having a look at is wind. And again, this has a slightly different shape to some of the other graphs we've looked at. Um, the scientists have done an experiment where you put potometers with a plant under different wind speed conditions and then have measure how much or how fast transpiration occurs and plot it on a graph and then you end up with 
a graph looking like this. So let's have a look. We're now looking at wind. And we're starting off with no wind. Okay, and that's right here. When the wind velocity is low. In other words, there's no wind or there's very little wind. What's your transpiration like? It's low because the water vapor moving out of the leaf remains near the leaf, which decreases the concentration difference or gradient. And because there's a low concentration gradient, transpiration occurs slowly. Now let's have a look at what happens when the wind velocity gets higher. So that was we looked at low, it's now high. And what's happening to this curve? Wow, it's going up and up and up. And the reason is the wind removes the water vapor from the leaf surface, replaces it with dry air. So that means your concentration difference remains high. So your transpiration would occur more and more quickly. And that is why the more wind there is, the higher the transpiration rate is. And this little cartoon shows basically what happens here in still air. This shows the layer of water that's kind of sticking around after transpiration. And here, it's actually quite thick because there's nothing blowing the air away. If we look at this one, there's much less water sticking around the leaf because a lot of it is being blown away. And the faster the wind is blowing, the more of this layer will disappear. Well, I think your brains are probably bursting now, so maybe it's time for a break. Welcome back from your break. Before the break, we had a look at transpiration and the factors that affect transpiration. What we're going to look at in this part of the lesson is how do they ask questions on this particular type of thing? Now, many questions on transpiration start off with experiments or use an experiment as an example. And the problem is this is not necessarily an experiment that you have seen. It's not necessarily an experiment that you know about, but you have to look at it, work out what is happening in the experiment, and then try and link it to, for transpiration, it's either going to be a change in the environmental factors, in other words, your wind, humidity, um, light intensity, temperature, or it might have something to do with a plant and how its leaves are structured to try and lessen the amount of transpiration that occurs. And you guys need to be on the ball so that you can actually pick up what you need to get from each particular experiment that has been um, put down in the question. So we're going to be looking at a couple of these experiments and looking at, well, how do you go about this? How do you think the answers out? And how would you go about answering them? So, first one is looking. Oh, I forgot to say, this is also an ideal opportunity for the examiner to test your practical skills. What do I mean by practical skills? It's things like ability to draw a graph, ability to draw a conclusion, knowing what a hypothesis is, knowing what dependent and independent variables are. So they're often tied in with these experiments on transpiration. 
So let's have a look at this first example. So it's two plants, how much water they've lost, and key. One plant had small leaves with a thick cuticle and hairy epidermis. And this tells you straight away that this plant is going to undergo less transpiration. The other plant had large leaves with a thin cuticle. So what they're testing here is how different plants are adapted to lessen the amount of transpiration. Now, the experiment was done and the change in mass of each twig was measured. In other words, they didn't use a pitometer, they just put the twig in um, the sun and then they looked to see how much water it had lost and they measured that by seeing how much weight it had lost. Okay, and they then worked out the percentage loss of mass. And they then put it in a table. And you have to be able to interpret tables like this. So, when you get a table, you have to try and work out what is this table actually telling me. So let's have a look at this table and work out what information can we gain from this table. Okay, first of all, one plant is losing a lot of water. One plant is not losing so much water. What does this tell us straight away before we've even looked at the questions? Which is the plant with large leaves? and a thin cuticle. It's obviously got to be the plant that is losing the most amount of water. So before you even start looking at the questions, look and see what is the table telling you. So the table is telling you that of these two plants, one is losing water very quickly, and the other one, in the same amount of time, is losing about half the amount of water. Now, let's look at the questions. A typical question like this, after, help, after expecting you to be able to interpret what is going on in the table, it asks you to draw line graphs. Now, I know many of you don't really like drawing graphs. You don't have to be an expert graph drawer. Because quite honestly, half, sometimes more than half the marks allocated to a graph are given for putting in a heading and labeling your axes and putting units on your axes. So that even if you draw, if you plot your points and the points aren't perfectly correct, you're not going to get naught for the graph. You're just going to be losing some marks. And in this case, because it's two line graphs, you're often also given a mark for either putting a key and using different symbols for each line or simply on your graph labeling each line as plant number one or plant number two. So don't be scared of graph questions. If you know what you're doing, they're actually an easy way to get marks. Okay, next question, explain why the greatest loss of mass occurred between 12 and 2. Now, this is linking the experiment to what you've learned about the factors which increase transpiration. And we know there are four factors which increase transpiration. The question says, why is transpiration the greatest between 12 and 2? And you should be able to work out 12 and 2, midday, sun is bright, so it would be high light intensity, and midday's hottest, so it would also be highest temperature. Then, the third one requires you to think. If you lived in a dry area, which of the plants 
would you plant? And why? And that's, this is where you use your common sense. You've seen the table which says the one plant loses so much water and you'd have to keep watering it if it was in your garden. The other plant you wouldn't have to water every day. So to make sense and to save water, which is the plant that you would plant if you lived in a dry area, that would be plant number one. Next question, and sometimes the description of the experiments are actually quite long. Don't let that fool you. Use a highlighter and pick up the important points. The length is simply to explain to you exactly what is happening in this experiment. Don't get bogged down in it. Highlight what is important. Okay, so we have two different species, A and B, and then they're using something called a wind tunnel. And the wind tunnel blows air at different speeds. And then they measure the amount of transpiration occurring. And this is where they would then use a pitometer to measure how fast transpiration is occurring. One of the questions that could be asked, what is the most suitable piece of apparatus to use in a wind tunnel to actually measure the amount of transpiration? And you could then say a pitometer. Okay, the rest of it is just explaining what happens. First, they had a wind of five meters per second. The rate was measured four times, then there was 10, then there was 15, and then there was 20. And your first measurement is in still air, so you've got one, two, three, four, five readings. And then those readings were used to draw up a graph. So let's try and interpret what is this graph actually telling us? Okay, it shows time, and on that axis, it also shows the transpiration rate, and here it shows the hours. And as you can see, these changes correspond to the different wind speeds that the plant was placed under. And as we can see, as the wind speed increases, what happens to your rate of transpiration? Increases. Oops, but does it occur the same in both plants? Remember, here we've got species A and species B. And species B is here at the bottom. So what can you tell straight away about species B? It's tough. It has something that means it doesn't transpire too much, whereas species A, whoops, that's going to die in the wind. Now, what questions could be asked? You could be asked to interpret, read off the graph, and here it says during which hour did species A have the highest transpiration rate, and that would be this point, which is here, between hours three and four. <clears throat> then the next one is explain why four readings are taken, and this is a practical skill. The more readings you take, the more accurate your results are. And number 2.3, three external factors, and that takes us to our humidity, light, and temperature. And here we have some more description, relationship between wind speed and transpiration, and that is directly from the graph. So you would talk about what is happening here on the graph. Then 2.5 is explain how the wind influences transpiration. And here you would talk about the wind blowing the moisture away. 2.6 you would have to explain what is happening inside the leaf with the water evaporating and moving out through the stomata. 
and then 2.7, which would not survive in a windy habitat, and that's obviously number A. And then the last question is an application question. Explain the benefits of using a greenhouse while growing plant, and that obviously is because in a greenhouse there isn't any wind. I hope that has helped you a little bit so you won't, when you look at questions like this, get a fright and wonder what to do. Thank you.